Good morning, and welcome to the Nine Network of Public Media. My name is Shelley Williams, and I am the Initiative Director of American Graduate. The initiative that I'm talking about is public media's response to the dropout crisis. And we started conversations very early on in local communities across the nation to better understand what the challenges were that our students were facing, what was happening in the classroom and, and in communities that students weren't graduating, uh, fully prepared to go into the workforce, fully prepared to meet their goals, their aspirations, and that they weren't graduating as big dreamers and thinkers. So as we started this conversation here in St. Louis with 50 plus community partners in 2011, we learned a lot about all of the different challenges that our students were facing. And part of those challenges start with the importance of early education and development. So essentially making sure that our young people are starting off on the right foot making sure that they are fully equipped socially, emotionally, that they are culturally sound, that they have the opportunity to really reach into their classrooms, to, to have mentors, to have pairing, caring, consistent adults, and to really know that someone does love them. So this morning, it's a very interesting intersection between early education and the business community. So all of you guys are um, from our local you know, community here in St. Louis, um, and you're here for a reason. Because essentially, when we really do start about thinking about the well-being of all of our children, that conversation quickly uh, moves into the well-being of our community. So the economy and how essential our children are to the vitality of that is what this conversation will be about today. So we do have a live stream, so we are online, so that many um, of our partners, many of our stations that we're working with across the nation can really join us in this conversation and better understand what this interesting dynamic looks like when the business community really does care about their community and starts to talk about that intersection of early intervention um, and early education and early development, and what does that look like for um, the aspirations of our young people in the future? So today, um, please, we got a couple of rules, which is don't hold back. That's number one. And this is a conversation, and this is a really good opportunity for us to not only learn from you, but think of this as your voice also throughout the community and also throughout the nation. We want to make sure that people do understand what the challenges are as we talk about this intersection and to get really good ideas from the business community about where do we start, where do we go, and what things do we not know, and what do we know that can make sure that all of our children have the equal opportunity to education, to live out their dreams and their aspirations, and that we as a community to come, can come together to make sure that they achieve those things. Here with me today um, is Brent Baxter, who is the Managing Director of Clayton Capital and also Loom Institute Board President. And Loom has been a very, uh, has been a great partner um, as we started to explore more in the early education space, the early development space, to learn more about what this means later down the line. So today, um, I would like to introduce Brent to, to speak to you as well. Good morning. I'm uh, Brent Baxter. Thank you for the introduction. And I'd like to start by thanking our partners here this morning, uh, the uh, Center for Public Broadcasting, Channel 9, and the American Graduate Initiative. Also, uh, you see behind me a, a list of all the folks that are here, our business partners, our academic partners, our community partners. We're very thankful that you're all here this morning. So as we begin to talk about the Loom Institute, what happens early in life lasts a lifetime and we're committed to elevating the quality of early childhood education. Loom Institute grew out of the best practices of the University City Childhood Center, been in business for 45 years, uh, working with young children. About 15 years ago, Steve Zwalek joined that organization and transformed their educational practices. And for 15 years, we've been accumulating these wonderful results, good data, and we've uh, launched the Loom Institute to share those learnings with the wider community. So Loom's purpose is about elevating the quality of early childhood education. We do that three ways. Uh, training of teachers, professional development, a program we call Family Matters, which is about educating families about the developmental issues of children, and we do consulting. We help startups, we help other early childhood centers improve their programs, their operations, and most importantly, the quality of their teachers. 
Uh, Loom Institute in the last five years has been uh, privileged to train about 3,000 teachers across the state of Missouri. When you think about each teacher has about 10 kids in a classroom, uh, in the past few years we've impacted the lives of 30,000 children. And we look to increase that dramatically. You're going to hear some data today about the importance of early childhood education. It's connectivity to success in life. Remember what happens early in life lasts a lifetime. These children that have quality early childhood education, higher job rates, higher high school graduation, higher college graduation, less crime, more successful marriages, this is what we're talking about. We're talking about the ability to change a generation every five years. You'll hear about Steve talk about the brain, 95% of the brain developed by age five. This is the intervention we're talking about. So I'm really privileged this morning to introduce uh, Steve Zwalek, truly uh, becoming a national voice for the importance of elevating the quality of early childhood education. Steve, Steve joined our organization 15 years ago. We had 30 kids in a small rundown building, and uh, today we serve over 160 children and families. We train 3,000 teachers across the state of Missouri, and we're hoping to uh, increase that uh, dramatically. Uh, of some significance, in January, uh, Steve and the University City Children's Center Loom Institute uh, received national recognition from the uh, American Psychological Association, Psyche, Psychoanalytic Association, sorry about that, uh, a national award recognizing that the way we teach teachers is radically different in the early childhood field. And that reward is a validation for the great efforts in, uh, of Steve and his team. So uh, Steve is a, a true pioneer, uh, a disruptor, a leader, uh, a visionary in the uh, field of early childhood education. And Steve is here this morning to share some of his thoughts and passion with all of you. Thank you. Uh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah. What a wonderful, what a wonderful morning seeing all your wonderful faces out there. Uh, Shelley was talking about big dreamers. Uh, how do we help young children become big dreamers? Well, I'm st I must still be five <laughs> because I keep dreaming and, and hoping that, that we can provide for children uh, something that's very unique and that we can change the lives of children, but really change the lives of the workforce, to change the lives of our community, to impact it in a different way. So uh, I continue to be a big dreamer. And um, so, and when she said, we well, get kids off to the right, on the right foot, it's really about getting them off because we hop and we skip. And all of those things are part of our world in early childhood education. Um, I, I want to thank, you know, I want to thank our panelists, and we'll, we'll acknowledge those uh, later uh, and, and more, and certainly Channel 9 for what they have done and our partnership with them as we move forward. Uh, we, Loom Institute, it, it's really, it started about five years ago, and we have uh, um, now realized that when we started five years ago, that our teachers are now changing generations because we believe that if 90% of the brain is developed by five, that we are impacting a generation every five years. And folks, I think that's really important because we often think of it as a, as a broader, on a broader spectrum. It's 20 years. No, it's five years based on what we know and you'll see as we continue uh, into, the, into the presentation. Um, the, 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 the belief that what happens early in life lasts a lifetime comes out of a collection of theory. We have a hundred years worth of theory about how children learn. We have observational research. We have um, brain research. And now we have economic impact data that really demonstrates that that what happens early in life lasts a lifetime, that quality care and education in those first five years of life will impact, uh, have impact for children for, for a lifetime. So we really need to look at this whole framework of early childhood in the educational system and flip the educational system upside down and start investing differently and supporting the field of early childhood from a significantly different role. And when we do that, 
We are forging children's ability to develop relationships, which is critical for the future. And to understand that we are building self-control and the executive functioning skills that children need to advance in our world. The world's getting really small and we need to be able to walk side by side with each other, frankly, without clubbing each other. The, the emphasis on empathy and compassion uh, needs to be dr driven home more. So the folks who are watching online, uh, we hope that you will participate with us uh, using Facebook and Twitter, using the hashtag um, A-M-G-R-A-D-S-T-L. And Channel 9 will continue to display that hashtag throughout the Q&A as well. So I w again, I want to thank Channel 9 as we move forward and all your support. And, and I would encourage everyone here to tune into Channel 9 uh, in the future. So today we're going to talk. I have a story. We're going to talk about There's a story. It's a story about education. It's a story about there's a crisis in education. Or is it an opportunity in education? We know the crisis because we're, we're losing generations of children. Generations of children through the achievement gap, through illiteracy, low graduation rates, which is what Channel 9 is really focusing on. And how do we increase the graduation rates in our community? We are seeing increase in diagnosed learning disabilities. Adverse childhood experiences, which is where kids are being born in traumatic, in, in traumatic situations when they have no control over. But the research is saying kids that are born with these adverse childhood uh, experiences are being affected for the rest of their lives, their health outcomes, and their adult life success. Things have changed. Lots of things have changed. If I were to ask you today, how has early childhood changed? Or how has childhood changed? You'd probably raise your hand and say, you know, it's technology. It's fractured families. We'd have a list of, of things that really demonstrate how childhood is changing. But the key element is child development is not. Children need... They need you, they need mommies and daddies, they need affect, they need what children have been looking for for decades and decades. They need to learn how to develop relationships. And we have just come off a time where we've been trying to teach to the head and we're learning that it is all about relationship. James Heckman, who you'll hear a little bit more about, he talks about families not having the resources to support the development of their child because the, 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 the landscape is changing enormously. And if we want to fix it, if we want to fix it, we need to think about how to do it before age five. 90% of the brain is developed by five, folks. This is a critical framework for us. We can make a difference because we know what happens early in life lasts a lifetime. Let's expand the horizon. In, two, in 1960, 10% of the children, three and four year old children, were in care outside the home for 40 or more hours. In 2012, that number went to 70%. And today, it ranges between 70 and 80% of our children are in care outside the home for 40 or more hours. So the landscape is changing. We know that families, that uh, two-parent working families has increased by, by uh, um, uh, three times. That fa single-parent families have increased by seven times. So the landscape is, landscape is changing. And what are we doing? How have we readied our edu early childhood educational system to, to ready up for 70 to 80 percent of the kids in care outside the home? It is our best opportunity 
to impact early childhood education. I think as you look at this particular graph, in this graph, it, it really describes the brain, the brain growth. 90% of the brain is developed by five, which you continue, you're gonna keep hearing that. Because if you leave with nothing today, we need to leave with that understanding. But look at where our, our public dollars are going. We're spending about 3% of our public dollars on children where we can have the most impact. So, as we continue to grow our, our landscape and understand the landscape, we have 70 to 80% of the children in our community in child care centers. And we have developed centers with a very fractured approach. We have Head Start, we have public school settings, we have religious centers, we have not-for-profits. We have all of these systems where our children are being educated and taught. Each, each piece has its own qualifications, its own standards. So, early childhood educators. Early childhood educators in our community and in our country are the, have the least amount of formal education. They are, are they, they're, 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 they're leaving their jobs. The turnover rate ranges from 30 to 40%. Now, we're fortunate in Missouri right now because we're about 28%. So when we think of that turnover rate and look at the, the impact it has on children, that if, if the first three years of life and the emotional development of a child is so critical and we have 30% to 40% turnover, what does that do? What does that do to impact child? What kind of relationships do these children develop as they grow? Do they have the capacity or do they get, do they get all steeled up and keep relationships away? We meet the minimal qualifications. And in, in, in Missouri, in our, in our state, our wonderful state, if you want to be an early childhood educator, you can be 18 years of age. Have a high school diploma, get a GED, be TB free, not be a felon. 70 to 80 percent of our children are in care outside the home. And who's teaching our children? What kind of a workforce are we developing? And yet, little has been done to advance the practice and the understanding of children. So we know what quality means. We know what quality is. We know that we need highly skilled teachers. We need teachers that, are, that, that know how to develop relationships with children. We need uh, uh, schools and teachers who understand curriculum. And a key element, there are two key things for academic success, language development and self-control. So in our schools, Language-rich environments are critical. Teachers being with children, expanding language with children. But yet, when we look at the Million Word Gap study, where their uh, families, uh, children in professional households, hear 35, uh, 45 million words by the time they're five. Low-income families hear 13 million. If you just take a look at the line, Look at the 36-month-old, uh, the, the, uh, month the three-year-old low-income child, and dance across that line where they're seeing 10 million words. The 12-month-old child that lives in a professional family hears the same amount. This is alarming. This is really alarming. Because language development is critical as children grow and develop. So, Loom Institute believes the power to change, the power to change society lies in the way we're teaching our young children. Are we attending to what that looks like? Loom Institute is elevating early childhood by teaching parents and, and teaching teachers, giving some new frameworks and how to transform the lives of our children and families. 
we, the Loom approach, we think, is disrupting traditional early childhood education training. It's disrupting how we're thinking. We're focusing on emotional development. How do we measure the emotional development of a child? It's really challenging and really hard. And we have some frameworks that we'll look at and as we start painting the picture and gathering data on this. We need to support the children's emotional development. Because when children have, have solid, solid emotional partnerships and somebody that they can depend on, whether it is family or teachers, they can, they can then take social risk. Those of you who have been in classrooms, you see those children in classrooms who are dabbling, and then they go, they go play with a friend and they get clobbered. They need, or they're the clobberer, they need somebody to go and support them in that. And as they, as they unwrap and unpack all of, these, all of this infrastructure, then they're ready for academic learning. They can take academic risk and they feel safe because they know somebody is there to support me. So we have this disruptive approach that is focusing on the psychodynamic or the emotional development of children, which inter interacts with, with a key element of rich language and, and literacy. And then the values and character component. And as we weave those together, that incredible tapestry of the, of the infrastructure of a child, we are able to teach the skills necessary. And children need these executive functioning skills. They need to have the ability to develop self-control. You ask any kindergarten teacher or any elementary school teacher what they want in their children. They can teach the content. They want children who can come in and contain. And they want to demonstrate self-control. They need, children need to have flex, uh, uh, mental flexibility where they, they're throwing a curveball. How do they have the resiliency when the curveball is throwing at them? We need, this is what we do in early childhood education, giving children working memory. And these are skills based on the emotional development of a child. So to mirror what we, we, we looked at earlier, look at the percentage of increase where, these, where the children are really developing their executive function and skills in those first five years of life. And it takes us back to this graph here. So we have 90% of the brain developed by five, executive functioning skills developing by five, and we're, we're putting our least amount of resources. Daunting thought for us. So we've been testing this out. And so we've been using the University City Children's Center, assessing how do we measure this? So we, we've picked three things to, to identify. Measuring a child's attachment, their ability to develop self-control, and their initiative. And the trends that we see is that when a child is in a, in a quality center, that they will, takes about four months to develop their attachments and solidify. As they develop their attachments, you can see that self-control increases, initiative increases, and bad behavior decreases. Bad behavior decreases when children have emotional partners and they have self-control. Key piece. So the next piece, the next framework we looked at is how does this, how does this equate into uh, cognitive skills? We're seeing that, that the children who are in quality care at University City Children's Center for three years are in the 91st percentile of children in the country. And that includes kids with disabilities. They're our children. These are our children. So we pulled that apart, dissected that more. And we see that African-American children are growing at 13% rate. They have a third, we're seeing an increase of 13%. And our, and our um, Caucasian families, we see an increase of 7%. So the indication is that we're beginning to see uh, achievement gap closure. We can do this, folks. We can do this. So the next piece, we looked at the economics of this. The economic framework, our free lunch families, our children on free lunch are growing at a 13% increase. Our full fee paying families at 6%. Again, we see achievement gap closure based on 
how we support children's emotional development. We talk about James Heckman when he says, when social skills are combined at an early age with cognitive skills, they help create a more capable and productive citizen. And we're going to take a minute to hear, um, uh, see a blip from uh, uh, the James Heckman. Everything we know in economics says the return on investment in people, especially very young people, very, very high. Right now, a lot of economists don't have a clue of what's going on. I mean, a lot of economists, and probably me included. But when we start thinking about how to get fixes to get the economy started again, we have to be a little more careful than we've been in the past. We have a big emphasis now on potholes, on infrastructure, it's called. The new director of OMB, Peter Orzak, has actually written a definitive study of what the economic rate of return is to potholes. And he found that they're pretty, pretty low, actually. What I learned and became so important was that investing in people was as important as buildings or structures or roads, although those are important too. There are many projects out there, but few have the rate of return of early childhood investments, offering 10% annual rate of return. So for the same dollars, you can actually invest by training teachers and training children. But what comes out of it is a reduction in crime, the promotion of schooling, the fact that we're going to get a more skilled workforce in the future. There are very, very few government programs that have any return close to this. These rates of return calculations have not entered American political life to the extent they need to. This is not just speculation. This is not, I represent no lobby group. It's a piece of analytical work. Early childhood programs is one of the highest returns that we have on the docket right now available to make an American society. So it's foolish not to use it. percent return on investment. Wouldn't it be nice to have that all the time? The 10 percent return on investment manifests itself in increased high school graduation rates. And as we know, Channel 9 is really investing hard. How do we, how do we increase graduation rates? We increase employment and, employment and earnings. And a new, a, a new player on, in my arena is how can we really improve health outcomes? And, and I know Jason will address that uh, a little bit today. Um, and the, the, where we save money is we reduce teen pregnancies, we reduce alcohol and drug abuse, uh, we, and, and, and reduce the participation in crime and criminal, criminal activities. This is where it is. This is where we're seeing it. So, Today, investing in early childhood education has four, four major takeaways for us. It is, it closes the achievement gap. Investing in early childhood closes the achievement gap. It improves health outcomes for children. It boosts earnings, and it grows a skilled workforce. So when we think of the benefits, what is it that we want you to take home today? We want, to, we want you to view quality early childhood education as the infrastructure for all academic and career success, which means that we honor early childhood as a key component that if families are paying fifteen to eighteen thousand dollars, are investing in their child, or if our if our system invests in children, we are honoring the importance of early childhood education, and we need to think about investing in quality early early childhood educa education programs that support families, support the community, and support our workforce. And the third piece is we need to work together to build the next generation. And we can do that. So thank you. <laughs> we'll turn the next, next piece. I'd like to introduce uh, Anne-Marie Berger, who is a senior uh, producer for Channel 9. And she will work with the uh, panel. 
Great. Thank you, Steve. Um, and thank you for your expertise in all things early childhood education. Um, what you just presented here is very profound and very important. Um, and yes, I'm a senior producer here at the Nine Network. I work directly with our initiative, um, American Graduate. Uh, but what's not on my professional bio is that I am also a mom to a three-year-old, uh, Sophia. She's hopping and skipping and jumping. Um, so I'm very much involved in early childhood education. It's what we do when I'm at home. It's where she is right now. Last night when I read her, her favorite story, what the sleepy animals do at Audubon Zoo, and I asked her if she could point out the white alligator. And she looked at me and she said, mm, I'm not sure. Give me a sec. And I laughed, because first of all, it's the cutest thing to hear a three-year-old, she just turned three, say that. And I was also proud, because she communicated so eloquently to me that she needed a second to think about it. And she did. She thought about it, she pointed to it, and she was extremely pleased with herself. But I'm, I'm the choir here, so I, I'm involved with early childhood education because it's where I am in my personal life. But what's important about early childhood education is getting everybody else to realize that they need to care too. That it's more than just about me and what we're doing with our family, but it's what we're doing with our region and our economy, other people's children, other people's grandchildren, and what's important there. So that's why we've brought in this blue ribbon panel over here uh, to elevate that discussion. Uh, we have John Brown, Managing Director at Bush O'Donnell. Dr. L. Carol Scott, Chief Executive Officer at Child Care Aware of Missouri. Frank Steves is the Executive, Executive Vice President, General Counsel, and Secretary at Emerson. And Dr. Jason Purnell, Assistant Professor at Washington University in St. Louis. And I'm going to start off with you. Um, first of all, also remember we do have our hashtag, uh, hashtag AmgradSTL. And if you're out in the Twitterverse, please send us your tweets. Um, we'll try to answer some of your questions as they come in. Um, so you've personally uh, supported and donated for early childhood education, specifically the University City Children's Center. Mm -hmm. um, there are a lot of organizations that one can support. There's a lot of great work being done here in St. Louis. What are some of the things that you look for when you're looking to uh, support an organization? Well, I'll tell you how I got involved with Steve in particular early on. Uh, Steve had actually been a teacher at a different school for one of my kids. And I saw Steve's different approach in this very buttoned down community as he came hopping and skipping down the hall one day, <laughs> singing a song with a trail of kids behind him all hopping and skipping. And they were actually the only people in the place enjoying themselves <laughs> that day. So that struck me and I felt very fortunate when Steve uh, taught my own son. And then uh, he moved over to the University City Children's Center and started getting involved there and, and gave me a call and said, you know, I think I might need a little help. Will you come by? Mm -hmm. That's one of those calls where you say, hmm, what's this going to entail? <laughs> and 16 years later, here we are. So what attracted me to the University City Children's Center and to Steve's model was really what I didn't see more than what I did see. I saw a lot of need. Uh, physical need from the, the plant itself, uh, from the building that we're in. Uh, but what I saw was a core dedicated group of teachers. I saw engaged kids in the classroom. I saw families who really wanted their kids to succeed. And I saw a guy who wasn't quite sure how he was going to bring this all together, but he had a much bigger mission in mind. And I was sold on that. I think if you can find a way to act locally, with a group that you can follow and support and help them really succeed, that you have a chance to really impact communities. Would you say that your contributions to the center um, is actually an investment in our region? I, I measure investment differently because investing is what I do for mm -hmm. a living. Uh, so I look at actual returns and it's interesting to see the uh, economic analysis for the 10% return mm -hmm. on investment. And, and we'll talk about that quite a bit, too. I think that number might be higher. Uh, but what I was doing was not looking for a financial return. <clears throat> what I saw is the ability to actually make a donation that would continue giving for many years. 
And that's really what you're after mm -hmm. as a donor. If you can go give to uh, a large institution, you might buy a new door. Right. If you go give to an institution like this center was, you might keep the doors open for a while. And that early incubation of the U City Children's Center and what that has grown into is something that I am in awe of. And it's a lot to do with Steve and his dedication, but it's also a lot to do with the program that he's developed along the way that he is now spreading and I think can be a, a keystone for success for a lot of communities, not just the one we started in. Dr. Scott, um, let me ask you a question here. We've heard about brain research. We've heard about the impact on our workforce and uh, on our economy. Um, but tell us uh, what the impact of diverse systems, settings, and program types on the outcomes uh, for, for children. That's a great question. And some diversity of setting and um, in our non-system, I would call it, we don't have a system. Um, some diversity of setting is good. Some parents want and need a center-based program. Some parents want and need a family home setting. I think our challenge around the diversity of our current system of, of scattershot is it has grown up uh, out of um, not a need of the market nor a need of the the other ends of the workforce development pipeline, if you will. So it's, it's come about based on uh, historic factors that really don't have anything to do with what we know now about the first five years of life and their importance. So we have a non-system of lots of different venues, lots of different auspices of nonprofit, for-profit, um, school-based, not school-based, mom and pop shops that serve 10 children mm -hmm. or four <laughs> children versus large centers like U-City Children's Center where there are you know, 150, 100, 200 children. And the, the problem that we have with that system is not that it's, at, perhaps not that it's as diverse it is, as it is, but that we don't have any information about the diversity of the quality. We know that children are in different kinds of settings. We don't know how good most of them are. And we don't have any way in this state or in this community to measure ob objectively from outside some of the kinds of things that Steve showed us with his data. Outcomes data about what's happening for the children are crucial and because that economic return on investment that Dr. Heckman talks about is a human capital investment. It isn't an investment in potholes, it's an investment in people. And that investment happens for those children, but not in all settings and not systematically. It's very much, uh, kind of throw the spaghetti at the wall and see what sticks non-system. And it doesn't help our outcomes for kids. Why, why is that? Why isn't it something that's top priority to invest in the minds of young people? You know, there's a lot of political stances that keep people out of, uh, out of this conversation, uh, if you will. Um, folks think that what happens in a family stays in a family. So if parents choose to go to work, then whatever they choose to do with their children is their business and nobody should have a say in that. Mm -hmm. Nobody should be really looking at whatever those choices are and where those children are. But just as we decided many, many generations ago that education from kindergarten through high school and college was an important societal investment for us to pay attention to, we now understand from the neuroscience and the social science that those first five years of education are absolutely more important, perhaps, than the K through 12 years. They lay the foundation, and so we really have to pay attention to what happens there. Are there any policy solutions? Um, certainly one of the policy solutions would be to implement a way to measure objectively the quality of programs and to require that all programs participate in it. We have some uh, changes happening now. There's a new federal law that was just reauthorized that's going to bring a little bit more oversight to some early care and education programs, especially those that are not licensed. And in Missouri, we have about 4,000 settings that are currently not licensed and have no oversight by anyone. And I got to tell you, even in our license settings, some pretty awful things happen um, that you can see on the news pretty much any week that you want to. We so what happens in those non-licensed settings, we don't know at all. We do have a question from Twitter, um, which plays into this, as to why is public po policy so slow to catch up with research? Again, I think it's, it's historical um, resistance to involving government in the family of young children. We see young children as being very much about spending time with their parents, with their families, and not needing public services. But as Steve pointed out, 70% of children are in families where their all available parents are in the workforce. We really all need to care about where those children are and what's happening to them. Mr. Seif, let me ask you a question. Um, 
what role do you see business, businesses and corporations, um, ad, how can they advance early childhood education? What role can they play? Sure. Um, first of all, I want to thank the Nye Network and Loom Institute for putting on this program. This is critically, critically important and not really well understood in the you know, public at large. Um, before I launch into the answer, I want, to, I want to talk about something in China. There's a city in China called Xi'an, in English, X-I-A-N. And that city is in central China. It's a medium-sized city. And uh, it's unique in three different ways. One, it's called City of Gardens. It's very beautiful, City of Gardens. Two, it's where the terracotta armies were discovered, mm -hmm. which many of you may have heard about. So it's unique in that respect, a very, very moving site, very beautiful. But number three, there are 65 universities in Xi'an, 65. In the city of Xi'an, the universities in Xi'an graduate more engineers, just that one city, than the entire United States university system graduates every single year. Um, that's a statistic that has been tossed around a lot in, in industry in the United States and in industry in the United States, industry in Europe. It's like, wow, you know, we have to wake up. So how does industry react to that? Well, they react by the STEM programs you heard about, science, technology, engineering, mathematics, mm -hmm. which is very popular right now and supported by the White House, supported by industry. And they react by, as we do, and as Boeing does, and as Siemens does, and as ABB, and all these global engineering companies and technology companies do, by tossing money into university engineering programs, technical school programs, and everything on the back end mm -hmm. of the education curve. But I think there's a growing realization that while that funding is critically important, it's really a tactical solution to a strategic problem. Um, we can fund, as we do, scholarships to UMSL and to Harvard and to all over the country and to, to, to European universities um, every year, year after year. And we do that, many corporations do. But, for example, where we're located in, in Ferguson and proudly in Ferguson, where we've been for 70 years, we can fund scholarships there, but those students, the technical students, they receive a great education at our expense. Sometimes they come to work for us, sometimes they don't. It's just not conditional on that. But then what do they do? They move mm -hmm. <laughs> to another community so they can, they can have a better life for their families, and it does nothing for bring, to bring the whole community up. And the answer is to deal with the, as the other two panelists say, deal with the underlying strategic issue which is the, the fact that children are not being educated in the home anymore. Parent, they're not being read to by their parents. The parents aren't there. Some, in some instances, the parents themselves can't read to begin with. And we believe, and I strongly believe, that if we address the strategic issue of early childhood, then the higher education issues will take care of themselves down the road because the children will have the tools. They are going into school without being equipped, without having the tools mm -hmm. to learn. They don't know how to learn. They don't know how to address their emotional responses, keep them under control. They don't know how to deal with human development and the thing, all, all the th stuff that's tossed at as we're growing up. They don't know how to do that at all. And so as a result, you get kids in elementary school and in, in middle school and in high school that are not equipped to handle education at all, handle learning. And so business, I think, has the same I, get, I wouldn't really call it a problem, but I would say the lack of understanding that the political leadership has, which is you're all focusing, we're all focusing on the back end as opposed to on the front end. And if we re-emphasize, we change our emphasis from the back a little bit, move it to the front end, recognizing the current state of the family and, 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 where, and that the children are not equipped to enter the school system um, for whatever individual reason they have, then I do believe these things will take care of themselves. So we're starting to realize it, and we're investing um, quite a bit of money into early childhood. We're starting to, other businesses are trying to realize it. It's a little more difficult, though, because the, immediate, the results are not immediately seen or known, because it's not as though you give a scholarship to a good student, they go and get a degree, and they become an engineer. It's not that at all. It's more of a 15-year process, or an 18-year process, but it's one that has to be done. We're starting to recognize that. Other industry is, and I think the industry will, pay a, will play a large part in it, but it's not going to be easy. Is it something that other corporations are catching on? I mean, obviously, this is something that you all care about. Is this something that, that, that you see across business? Yeah, it, it, it is a little bit, and I talk with my, my peers and colleagues, 
And I think there's a growing realization due to programs like this, mm -hmm. due to the work Loom is doing and other great institutions around the United States, that it starts there. It starts in early childhood. And you, do with, you take care of early childhood. You make that a quality educational and learning experience for young children. And they will be equipped to go into the school system and do much better. And these back end problems will take care of themselves. And we won't be spending as much money on remedial work, which is really what it is. Right. And we, when you're giving somebody scholarships or you're giving somebody things, a lot of it is remedial work. Well, and early childhood opportunities for all children, because some of them, like, like my daughter, she's a, we're able to give that to her. But there's others that aren't, that aren't able to do that. Absolutely. Yeah, the, 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 so many so people. She's already are so, got a leg up. Yeah. You know? So many people are so. D deprived of critical care, and I don't mean care physically, although that exists too, but care for their minds. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what really has to be taken care of. I think industry has a role to play, is mm -hmm. the bottom line. We have a, a very distinct role to play, but industry has the same issues that the political leadership has, which is the lack of connecting the dots between early childhood experiences and later in school mm -hmm. experiences. So as a result, we tend to deal with the tactical and, and not deal with the strategic. Well, Dr. Pinal, let's, let's uh, segue over from the economic impact to the impacts of, of health. What are those, in, the impact of health um, so, in regards to early childhood education? So there was a study that came out uh, last year, March of last year, in the, the journal Science, uh, which looked at one of the most studied, most rigorous uh, experiments that we've done in high quality early childhood, the Carolina Abbasidarian Project in North Carolina. This was providing intensive, high-quality early childhood intervention, including nutrition and well-child visits and medical care for children between the ages of zero and five. And we've actually followed those children up over the last 30 or 40 years. What we find is that as adults, the children who were randomized to receive that intensive, high-quality education, early childhood education, have lower risk for cardiovascular disease, uh, for what we call metabolic syndrome, some of the factors like hypertension and high cholesterol that we associate with diseases like diabetes. And these are the number one killers of Americans. Uh, cardiovascular disease is the, the leading cause of death in the United States. And we're seeing at 35, 40 years old, people having lower risk as a result of having participated in, in high quality early childhood. And it's not just a health outcome. We spend almost 20% of GDP on healthcare in this country. Uh, and, and you talk about the burden for business, mm -hmm. healthcare costs are burdening American industry. Uh, but we're spending, again, on the back end to treat health instead of preventing uh, healthcare problems in the very earliest years of life. What's the difference that those lives, the paths took that cause better cardiovascular health? Is it just, um, their educations were better and so they could have a better life? So there's both direct and indirect effects that we see. Um, one of the direct effects that they found even in childhood, and this, this, these effects seem to have been uh, stronger in males than in females for whatever reason, was a lower rate of obesity. And we know the burden that obesity has on health outcomes for the United States and, and around the world, a growing obesity epidemic. Um, but also there are these indirect effects. All of the things that Steve talked about in his presentation, higher levels of high school graduation, better incomes, uh, more connection and, and more uh, embeddedness in the, in the social fabric of the community, all of that also has health impacts. We know that there is a widening gap between the life expectancy of people who have some college or more education and the people who have high school or less education. Mm -hmm. uh, in one analysis between 1990 and 2000, people at high school or less gained no years of life expectancy versus people who have some college or more gaining about a year and a half of life expectancy. And that gap has been widening. So when you look at the educational outcomes, some of the social and economic outcomes that are a result of high quality early childhood, you can see those indirect effects on health. Like I said, you know, my, my daughter is in a quality early childhood education program and since she was four months old. Um, and it's been a sacrifice for my husband and I. Um, actually, her child care and her early childhood education is uh, a month is more than our mortgage. Um, but we're willing to make that sacrifice and I don't, I don't regret it. Um, 
But like I said, a lot of people aren't able to do that. I mean, we're fortunate, she's fortunate, and that is not lost on me. Um, if everyone, if we up the ante with early childhood and there's more training and there's better programs, how are families supposed to uh, afford that and support that? Um, Aaron, is that, is that right? You're working with the state on a tax, uh, a cigarette tax. Is that something that could possibly help families afford this? Definitely. We have the opportunity in Missouri to raise the tobacco tax, which we're currently the lowest in the nation, at 17 cents a pack. If we raise it an extra 50 cents, it'll bring in $250 million annually uh, to the state of Missouri. And we would like that money to go towards uh, quality early childhood development for kids aged birth to five. So it would be a huge increase. Right now, the state invests about $37.5 million on our, our state-funded preschool, which is basically a pilot program, and quality programs like Parents as Teachers. So an extra $250 million to this uh, investment would be a huge win for kids. Great. Any follow-up to that? Any? Um, I I think if we don't um, come up with a way to invest in a real change, and I think um, a lot of people have a lot of smart ideas uh, in this state, in this room, and around the country, we don't have to reinvent any wheels. We know what to do, as Steve said. We know what quality looks like. And we know what community investment looks like when it's effective. Mm -hmm. So I think having this opportunity to invest in early care and education is going to make a huge, huge difference. We do have one more, one more tweet out there. Um, Let's see, where is that? Okay, here it is. Uh, <laughs> reports, uh, 90%, sorry, I can't read that far. Reports, 90% of the brain is developed by five. How do we make sure children are thriving in language-rich environments? Anyone? Steve, anybody up here? Well, Steve referenced professional development of the staff, and he actually was very generous with our child care licensing rules. You know, yes, you, don't, you can't be a felon, and yes, you have to be 18, and you must be free of tuberculosis, but you don't actually have to have a high school diploma. You can work in an early care and education setting, a licensed early care and education setting in Missouri without a high school diploma. So you know, we know that people come in with a minimal, minimum of skills sometimes, and providing them with an understanding of what children need, and especially how to provide that language-rich environment, and that emotional support is crucial. I, I think as we, as we consider uh, uh, reassuring that children are growing up in language-rich experiences, it, it really goes to uh, teacher development. Yep. And as teachers, and I'm going to say, I'm going to use the framework triage, as teachers are providing that type of intellectual and emotional triage in classrooms, it really gives a, a, a different level of importance and framework. And as teachers um, see value in language, and as opposed to saying, good job, we start, and this sounds so simple, mm -hmm. but instead of saying, good job, it is, good job, look what you've done. You've taken your blocks and you moved them here, you moved them there, and you get think, kids to start helping with that working memory. Mm -hmm. And it, it becomes an executive functioning skill. And we have, and frankly, in our room, we have one of the leading uh, literacy experts uh, here today. I don't know, Susie, do you have anything that you'd like to impart on that? Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you, Steve. There are two topics that have rippled through that are so very, very important. That has to do with how children develop language and literacy. We've learned so much in the last 20 years about how children learn and develop in the language area. And it also ripples into what many people have mentioned this morning, and that is the importance of quality professional development. Just as you want your doctor to be absolutely current and to develop new ways of thinking, the same is true of every single individual who goes into that classroom for 70% of the families in this country who bring their six-week-old up to their five-year-old into a classroom. And it depends upon and I always say the quality, the linchpin for quality early childhood is the human interaction. And it's that teacher that Carol has talked about and that Steve has talked about. How do we influence their thinking? Because we now know that our behavior and our interactions with children is based on how we think about them. And 
language and literacy, the fundamentals, there's nothing fancy about this. It's reading, writing, speaking, and listening. And it begins at birth. It begins with the first birth cry. Now, I add thinking. I think also it's very important, and that's been mentioned this morning as well, to develop children through our educational system that know how to think. When they get to be an engineer, when they're in the investment business, they have to know how to think. Unfortunately, our system in the United States right now is encouraging rote learning. And that's what the Loom Institute and Steve is doing so effectively with teachers, is changing the way they're thinking about how, how uh, children grow and develop, and that impacts language, which impacts professional development. So thank you for that question. Thank you. We've got a comment over here. Yeah, this kind of ties directly into that, and it was one of the statistics that Steve mentioned, and this is kind of a question now to the business community. So we look at those teachers and investing in their professional development, yet there's a 30 to 40% turnover rate in the early education community that is of those teachers. So what if an Emerson had a 30 to 40% turnover rate? How successful would a business be in producing quality results? How can we expect quality results in our children if we have a 30 to 40% turnover rate? Yeah, it would be impossible. It would be impossible to function and compete on a, on a global scale. And, and languages, I think, is a, a really great topic because we have fallen down as a country terribly in languages, so you go to, I spent a lot of time in Russia and a lot of time in China, and, and you go there, every child at three years old is learning English in Russia and in China, or in Russia, either English or German, um, every single one. And, and the, the, everywhere you go to conduct business and wherever you're talking to people, they're speaking many, many languages. Many of our employees in Europe or in China speak three, four, five, six mm -hmm. languages fluently and write most of them as well. And in the United States, we're just, the United States, I think, is una will be unable in the future to retain its kind of insular outlook that it had. We're in a global business environment. We're in a global legal environment. We're certainly in a global financial environment. When you look what the currency and, and the, the strength of the dollar against other currencies is doing to our own economy. And, uh, and we don't escape that like we used to be able to. The, the US isn't as large an economy or as large of a population in a relative sense to the other countries as it once was where it could be in that way. And the trends are working against us. And so we need to become, a we, we need to change our attitudes to become our global language is really, really key. Um, and uh, and I, I, I couldn't imagine a better place to start. And I want to be respectful of everybody's time here today. We just have a couple of minutes left, and I'd like for each of you, if you could you know, take 30 seconds and uh, give us what you think. What, what do you want people to walk away from this today from? What should, what should people in this room, what should people watching, what should people watching two weeks from now, what should they take away from this conversation? Well, I'd like to bring a slightly different perspective to it. We've talked a lot about top-down policies and tax policies, which we can discuss later. Uh, but really what I like about this approach is it's a bottom-up approach. It's not a we have a global problem, we have an international problem, and we're going to have to shovel some money at it to solve it, because I don't believe that does solve it. But from a ground-up approach, taking a good program with dedicated people and strong training, you can affect local communities, and that will spread in a networked fashion mm -hmm. so that people feel franchised, feel a part of the system, feel rewarded by the system for being in it rather than being disenfranchised and disengaged and having the poor help outcomes and everything else that comes with that. If you believe your future is brighter than your present, then you will work toward that future and that ground up approach is what will grow strong communities. Great. Dr. Scott? I want to go back to the question about the turnover of teachers because this is a completely interruptible non-problem. We can fix this. If every single, you know, I said there were almost 4,000 unlicensed programs, there are almost 4,000 licensed programs as well. We're looking at a workforce of somewhere in the neighborhood of 20,000 people statewide. If every single one of those people who worked with young children had to have nine hours 
of training on the emotional development of children inside their first quarter in the classroom with children or before they ever walked in the door and had somebody, a mentor or a coach, work with them for the first six months about how to apply what they learned. The kind of behavior that they experience from children that drives them, frankly, out of the workforce pretty quickly would completely change. They can, the teachers can interrupt the very behavior that makes their life miserable and makes them likely to turn over. I mean, yes, it's also about low wages. But think about if, if the emotional safety of the child is built from birth to about walking age, when you don't have it and you have a room full of 16 of those little walkers running around wreaking havoc, how would you like to be the teacher in that room? Right. And if she can just create some emotional safety and help those kids develop self-control and some of those executive functions, that problem is over. And we can reduce turnover down to below 10% with just that intervention. Excellent. Yeah, I'd like to speak to any members of the, um, of the audience uh, who are leaders in business or in industry in the United States and, and ask whether or not they would start with a raw material that was inadequate for the job and use that and incorporate them into their products. <laughs> okay. And they wouldn't because what would happen, it would fail, it wouldn't perform, it would, it would be unable to sustain the test of time. And the same thing when you're talking about human resources, which everybody acknowledges, are critical, the most critical component of any successful enterprise, whether it's an academic enterprise or a, or a business enterprise or an, or an engineering, it makes no difference. And here we're talking about the underlying preparation, underlying raw materials that go into our human resources. And if we don't start thinking that it's important as a country, as a the political leadership, and I applaud Aaron's efforts on the legislation, and we are going to support those, <laughs> so we will get together, then we will end up failing as a nation, because the rest of the world isn't stopping. You know, we don't, for those of, the, those of us that don't travel internationally, we don't always see it, but I absolutely guarantee that anybody who has traveled outside of the country realizes that the rest of the world is moving forward very, very rapid, and we need to keep up. Dr. Fernell? I would say it's not that we'll end up failing, we're already failing. Uh, when you compare us to other wealthy nations in the world, we've got one of the highest infant mortality rates, we've got one of the highest child poverty rates, we've got one of the lowest subsidies for low-income parents in the state of Missouri in the entire country for child care. Um, so we, have to, we do have to think about some of the realities, and I think that the role that the business community can play is, is multifold. One is taking this message out to the rest of the corporate community and really being champions for this kind of work, but also using the influence that corporations have with policymakers to make this, <coughs> excuse me, make this a priority among uh, policymakers and decision makers at the political level, uh, and also to find strategic ways to make investments, whether they're private-public partnerships or corporate philanthropy, where you do seed uh, some of these demonstration projects and, and show that they can work. I think there's multiple things that our corporate partners can do. Great. Well, thank you. And, and becoming a champion, celebrating champions, is something that we're doing with American Graduate. Um, I encourage you all to go to our website, uh, ninenet.org slash American Graduate. Um, look at what we're doing. Uh, celebrate an American Graduate champion. Become an American Graduate champion yourself. If you have any um, Want to learn more? You contact Steve. Um, you can contact him directly at the Loom Institute. Um, there's uh, his contact number just went across the screen um, for those of you watching at home. But thank you all for being here. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your expertise and your thoughtful discussion. And hopefully, uh, we will uh, make a difference and see change in the, in the future here. Thank you.